Rest of you, if you will, turn to what some consider to be the greatest chapter in all of the Bible. Romans chapter 8. Learn a lot of things in Romans chapter 8, and, and I want to talk about that for just a few minutes today. I don't normally take a whole chapter, but I'm going to take a whole chapter today <clears throat> and talk about the believer's security because uh, that's what Paul is talking about here. One of the most basic and really the most profound truths of Christian growth and experience is to understand that we have been saved, that God saved us for his purposes and not for our own. It was for his sake that he saved us, not our own sake. And to grasp that, to understand that, really sets the whole of human life into an eternal perspective. We, we are, are able to begin to, to look after salvation. We can look at our lives and, and each part of it becomes a sacred responsibility and, and an opportunity to advance God's kingdom in the world. And we begin to see, and this is something that has always really kind of struck me uh, as amazing, and that is that each one of us have been strategically placed by God where we are. I am not here by accident. You are not here by accident. Uh, we have been strategically placed to be where we are in order to be an agent through which God can work. So I can look at my job and, and, and see that how I do my job becomes a, an issue of eternal importance for the cause of Christ. I can look at my marriage, a, a sacred covenant by which God strengthens society. He trains the next generation. This is God's idea according to the book of Malachi. He, he trains the next generation uh, through the family and he illustrates to the world the relationship that exists between Christ and his church. I can look at my finances and see that it's God's design to reward my labor, to provide for my family, to support the advancement of the cause of Christ in the world, and to demonstrate practical grace and mercy to those in need. I can look at the relationship that I have to the church and, and see that it is God's method of, of uniting his people in order to accomplish the Great Commission. Uh, he doesn't ask us all to do it all by ourselves. He has given us a body of believers that we can be a part of, that, that combined we can seek to fulfill that mission. And also the church is a living illustration to this world of how there can be unity in the midst of diversity. I mean, just look at us. Just take a second and look around. We have different races, we have different ethnicities, we have different social uh, standing in the community, we have different jobs, educational background, and yet we all come together and we unite together to accomplish the Great Commission. That's God's plan. To have the self-centered view, which a lot of people have, as to why God has saved us, is to invite a self-centered kind of tunnel vision approach to the work of God so that the church becomes about our interests. This is about me. Coming to church is about me. It's about my interests, my needs. It becomes about how people respond to me. It's about what I like or what I dislike. When that becomes the approach that we take to the, to the church, to the local church, then it, comes, it becomes the all-consuming motivation. I become the all-consuming motivation of church life. Because everybody's supposed to like me. 
everybody's supposed to approve of me. And when, when you have you know, 100, 200, 500, 5,000 people who all have the same kind of tunnel vision approach, it doesn't make for unity. And what happens over a period of time is that the body, the local body, becomes balkanized. You remember that term from the 90s? The balkanization of Europe or of the Soviet Union? The Soviet Union was divided over language, over ethnicity, until it finally destroyed itself and they, they began to break off into groups of self-interest. They fought among themselves and unity became impossible and so the Soviet Union that was, on, when I was in, in school, the Soviet Union was the big bo boogeyman. I remember the first time I ever saw a Russian, somebody moved to our town from Russia. And, I mean, not literally, but it, it surprised me they had five fingers and ten, you know, on each hand and, uh, that, because they've been made such monsters over the time. They were just human beings, but their government and the way they did things, it was called balkanization, division into different groups. This can happen in the church when people begin to stake out their territory of self-interest uh, to the exclusion of, of how it's going to affect other people how, and to the exclusion of how it's going to advance the cause of Christ. The church in that kind of an atmosphere becomes unfocused. And not only are they unfocused, but they become very vulnerable. Uh, they become balkanized. That's why it's so vitally important that we as individuals understand in our individuality that we understand what it is we have been called to. That the salvation we have enables us, you and me, to be participants in a cause far greater than the benefits of that salvation. And we usually emphasize the benefits of that salvation uh, in a very narrow terms. Uh, I'm going to heaven, I'm not going to hell. That's what salvation means to me. But it's much, much more than that. We, we ought not to diminish or fail to appreciate the benefits, but, but we have to grasp them. And with, we have to do that with the understanding that they, those benefits merely undergird you and me in our pursuit of a higher purpose. I can rest in these benefits in order that I might have a solid foundation to reach for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And until we do get this in our mind, we will forever be lowland saints, uh, to borrow a uh, Pilgrim's Progress kind of analogy. We just meander in the wilderness of self-pursuit and we, we fail to strive for that higher calling. The book of Romans is a map, a triptych, if you will, uh, for, for this journey to be taken by the believer in his pursuit of God's higher calling. Paul writes this book with a destination in mind. Have you ever taken a trip without a destination in mind? Yeah, I haven't either. I've, I've seen some people on the road that I think uh, <laughs> began without a destination in mind, but most people don't do that. But Paul writes this book and he has a destination in mind. He is taking us to a place where the believer must choose the course of life that he's going to take in his relationship with God. He has explained all of the background, all of the foundational truths. He's, he's explained all of this. And he's talked about our salvation and what initiated that salvation. And he is leading us to a place where a decision has to be made based upon certain truths that Paul has laid out along the way. He has explained to us man's sinfulness and God's holiness. He has explained to us the need that we have and the process that God 
has provided for our justification. And as he moves closer to that crossroad of personal decision, Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1, he discusses what that salvation relationship has secured for you and me. And it's vital that we understand this too. Knowing Christ has secured something for us here and now that frees us to pursue God's eternal purposes and to do that, to make that pursuit with confidence, with security, and with assurance. That's how God wants you and me to live our Christian life. In Romans chapter 8, Paul tells us that because of our relationship with Christ and salvation, the believer need no longer worry about three crucial areas of life that often plague us with worry and drain us of the desire to strive for that higher calling because we're just not sure about these areas. I want you to note these three things with me from Romans chapter 8. They offer to us assurance as we come to this crossroad of decision in Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1. The first one is, uh-oh, crisis. Here we go. Let me see if I've got a battery in here. Yeah, I do. Hey, I'm ready. <laughs> you know I'm ready. Okay, here we go. First one is this. First thing we need to know, there is no condemnation. Paul says, therefore, it, there is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as a sin offering, condemned sin in the flesh. Why? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There is no condemnation. If you are a believer in Christ today, there is no condemnation of you in the sight of God. Now, I know we're Baptists and not Pentecostal, but listen. Let me say that again and give you one more chance. If you are a believer in Christ today, in the eyes of God, there is no condemnation of you. There we go. No speaking in tongues, no jumping over seats or anything, but I tell you, if there's ever a place in Scripture where that would be warranted, it's in Romans chapters, chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. We talked about this a few weeks ago. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but this chapter 8 marks a transition in Paul's focus. He has just spent seven chapters explaining how we are justified or saved by faith. Spent seven chapters doing that. And now we begin to explain <coughs> the results of that faith in the believer's life. And that's why the word therefore is there. You know, an, an interesting little tidbit, Paul, Paul uses the term therefore quite a bit. And, and in the book of Romans, he uses it 27 times. So he'll tell you something, and then he says, therefore. Now, what that means, as I've explained many times before, is that what Paul is saying is, this is the truth, this is the foundational truth that you must know now, because of that, this. Okay? This is true. This is how you ought to live as a result of that. 27 times he uses it. The word condemnation here speaks of the verdict of God upon the life of an individual. Not, not a, a mass group of people, but an individual. The verdict of condemnation from the hand of the holy and righteous God 
brought down upon each and every one of us. And not only does it speak of that condemnation, but it also speaks of the punishment that that verdict from the court of heaven demands. It carries the idea, this word condemnation, carries the idea of something being unfit for use. There is no more condemnation, no more verdict from God upon you and me that we are unfit for use in his kingdom. That's good news. This is a word not often used in our society. We don't like to condemn anything. We don't like to condemn anybody. We'd rather try to explain why that person, that individual, that that group of people ended up in that state, and more than likely, it's not their fault, it's, it's your fault. That's how we deal with it. But we don't deal with it that way in the mind of God. God condemns men and women because they're guilty. That's what Romans chapters 1 through 7 has talked about. We try to find a way to get people off of the hook. We don't want them to have to bear the brunt, but God says, no, this is the term, condemnation. It talks about the verdict of God and the punishment that is deserved. Christ said in John chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, that those who have not trusted in Christ already dwell in the arena of, of God's condemnation. They dwell in that arena right now. People say, well, you know, that's an awful harsh message to give to a dying world. It may be, but it is the message of the gospel. We are condemned already. God has has declared them unfit for use in his purpose. And Christ takes pains to explain that 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 is the present condition in the life of the unsaved person. We need to be aware of that. Say, why do we need to be aware of it? We need to be aware of it because we have the responsibility to take the good news of the gospel to them. No amount of doing good is going to change that in their life. I don't care how good they are, how much they give, how much compassion they may have upon the poor and other things. The issue is their relationship with God. And when when we put our faith in Christ, in repentance and in faith, Christ's life and Christ's righteousness are put to our account in heaven to the satisfaction of God And he removed from us his condemnation. We sing that song. I forget which one it is, but it says, I think it might be, uh, it might be a song that we sing. I don't remember what it was. But anyway, (laughs) there's a song. And it says that the wrath of God was satisfied. I think it's one of the Getty songs. The wrath of it. Do you know that there was a group I forget who it was, Methodists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, could have been Baptists, I don't know, a group who wanted permission to remove that, that phrase, that the wrath of God was satisfied from, their, from that song so they could put it in their hymnal. And thank God the Getty said, no, you're, you're not going to remove that because that's the gospel. The wrath of God upon you and me was satisfied through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and he removed his condemnation. He takes us out of the kingdom of darkness, and he places us into the kingdom of his dear son, Colossians 1, 12 and 13. On Christ's merits, he declared, on the day that you were saved, he declared as a judicial ruling that you are fit. For his purposes. The word in the New Testament is meet or qualified. So that when we as believers seek to serve him, 
We have the right to do it. <laughs> we have the obligation to do it. Because God's condemnation has been removed. And we have been removed from condemnation's darkness into God's light. And made by him on Christ's merits. Fit. Able. Meet. Qualified. To serve him in this world. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. That ought to cause rejoicing for every believer. Are you rejoicing today? <laughs> Sometimes we don't rejoice over things we ought to rejoice over. You know, it's almost like, oh, okay. It ought to send us on our journey to Romans 12, 1 with confidence and with determination because he's going to call upon us to do something that is very, very difficult and very, very unnatural for you and for me. But if Satan can get us to remain ignorant of this truth, if he can get us to doubt this truth, He's going to bog us down in our own sense of unworthiness. He's going to say to us, whisper in our ear, and he is going to say, what do you think you are doing? Trying to serve the Lord. Get out of here. Get out of here. You don't belong here. You don't belong in the service of Christ. Who do you think you are? In September of 1995, my nephew, Doug, who had played in the minor leagues in baseball, he played in Sarasota with the White Sox, with Birmingham, and then finally went to their AAA club in Nashville, which is, I don't know what it is now, but it used to be the Nashville Sounds. Back in September, if you know baseball, <coughs> they expand their roster. <clears throat> and they bring up some minor league players to give them a shot at maybe making <clears throat> the major leagues. Well, Doug got called up. He had a really good year at Nashville, and he got called up. He was a major league baseball player. Can you imagine that? That a, uh, a Brady <laughs> was in the major leagues. Uh, this was something me and my brothers used to dream about. My, my family uh, just dreamed about this. We've always loved baseball, and this was, this was just a major thing to us. And they, the family came up to see him play. We lived in Joliet at the time, and uh, they came up to see him play. It was a lot of fun, a very proud moment for all of us. One Thursday night toward the end of the season, I decided I want to go and see him play. And here's the thing. If you've got a family who plays Major League Baseball, you get free tickets. <laughs> <clears throat> so we had free tickets. So I, I wanted to go and see him play, and I, I asked Doug to reserve me some tickets if he would. And, uh, but I could only get one person to go with me. What is wrong with people? <clears throat> you know, I could only... <laughs> Get one person who would go. And so we went up. So me and my friend went, and after the game, we were talking to Doug at, by the White Sox dugout. And Doug said, uh, Uncle Steve, he said, would you like to come in to the uh, locker room with me? I didn't even pray about it. <laughs> I said, yeah. So he told us where to meet him there on 35th Street in Chicago by the White Sox offices. He said, just meet me at that particular door and I'll, I'll take you. I said, okay. So me and my friend went, stood by that door. <clears throat> After a few minutes, Doug came, walked us through the White Sox offices and at the back of the office complex, there 
there's a door that, that leads over to the locker room. You have to go down some steps, and there's a big gap, like from about the width of this. The bus was already uh, parked in there because they were packing up to go on a road trip to Minnesota. And so <clears throat> Doug led us across the, the way, and there was a guard sitting by the door to the locker room. I don't remember much about it except that he was eating a piece of chicken. I don't know why that <laughs> stuck in my, in my mind, but he was, uh, you know, so Doug went first, and then the guy saw us, me and my friend. And immediately, he stood up, and he said, no, you're not going. I mean, my heart sank. This is my big chance. And Doug turned around and he said, they're with me. And the guard said, okay. So we were in. We were in. Not because of anything we had done, but because of what Doug had done. We were there on Doug's merits, not our own. And I stood there. It was an amazing thing. I mean, stand there with all these players that you've watched play over the years, and you're standing there in the middle of them. And I looked around, and there was Frank Thomas. Now, if you're not a baseball fan, that probably means nothing to you, but he was known as the Big Hurt. And he is a big man, big, strong man. And he's now in the Hall of Fame. He was standing there. Looked around and Robin Ventura, the third baseman of the Chicago White Sox. Wow. Lance Johnson, the center fielder, Chicago White Sox. Ozzie Guillen, shortstop, Chicago White Sox. Steve Brady. <laughs> <laughs> second base. Calvary Baptist Temple. Slow pitch softball. We were all there. You know, brethren, when we seek to live out Christ's life in the wickedness of this world, I will guarantee you Satan is going to jump up and condemn us. And he is going to say to you and to me, who in the world do you think you are? You have no business here. Look what you have done. Look at the, at the, uh, the many times that you have failed. Do you really think that you measure up so you can be a player in this arena and you can be a player on this level? Look at the greats who've gone before you. Look at them. The Abrahams, have, have, have you ever offered a child in sacrifice at the command of the Lord? No. How about Moses? Have you ever parted a sea so people can go across? No, I've never done anything like that. I've never healed anybody that was sick. Look at these great people who have gone before you, the great things that they have accomplished. And they will whisper, he will whisper in your ear, you're nothing. You're a nobody. You are an unfit person to even be in the same room with these people. Get out of here. And it is at that moment that Christ will step up and say, they're with me. They're with me. Salvation secured for us the right to serve the Lord now. Why? Because in Christ, there is no condemnation. Second thing I want you to note, there is no alienation. Look at verses 26 through 34. In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. 
because we do not know what to pray for as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with unspoken groanings. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offered up him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can begin, bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. I chose the word alienation to describe what salvation has secured for us as it is expressed by the Apostle Paul here. Because the word implies, this word's word alienation implies to cause to be estranged from, to, to make unfriendly or hostile or to be indifferent towards someone. Please understand that God will not put up with sin in the life of his child, and he will punish and discipline as it is necessary to bring us back to this path to accomplish his saving purpose in us. But the, the point that I want to make in this section is that the Lord never becomes indifferent to us. He's never indifferent. As a matter of fact, if you look at verse number 26, you will find that the Spirit is for us. If you look at verse number 31, you will find out that the Father is for us. And if you look at verse number 34, you find that the Son is for us. So you have the Trinity is for us. The Father's for us, the Son's for us, the Spirit's for us. Have you ever felt in your life that no one was for you? You ever been there? The confidence and comfort that the believer ought to have always is that God is for us. He gives us strength in our weakness. He gives us translation in the ignorance of our requests. Aren't you glad that God didn't answer some of your prayers? And so we have the Holy Spirit up there listening here along with the other members and the, the Spirit is acting as an interpreter because we don't know what we ought to pray for the way we should. And so the Holy Spirit Here's our prayer, and he says, now, Father, <clears throat> just a second. That's not really what they meant. He translates for us. He intervenes so that circumstances that we face in our life, Romans 8, 28, will work to our good in accomplishing his purposes for us. Isn't that a great verse? And we know that all things, not some things, but all things work together for good to them that love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. All things. So that wherever I am in my life right now, God's working. He is working to bring it about. For our good. That doesn't mean that we're going to have an easy time of it. Doesn't mean that we're going to live life without struggle or difficulty, because that is not true. But what salvation secured for us is the confidence that when we know Him, 
in salvation. He comes alongside of us to work for us, to work in us, so that all things that happen to us bring us to the ultimate good purpose he had in saving us, which is conformity to the image or to the character of his Son. God is working in me right now. He is working in you right now. Whatever your circumstance is to bring you to that ultimate goal, that ultimate predestined, preordained goal of being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And one of these days, we're going to get there. God will never be alienated from us. He will never be indifferent. He will never be hostile toward the believer in the accomplishment of that purpose. Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 6. God is going to fulfill his purpose. So whatever is going on in your right, life right now, and I, I don't know what it is. However joyous or unpleasant it may seem, it is not God alienating himself from you. But rather, he is conforming you to the image of Christ. He is developing in you the character of Christ. Submit to it. Don't get bitter about it. That's the security the believer can have in his relationship with Christ. And in that confident assurance, we can move toward Romans 12, 1 decision, knowing God is for us, God will help us as we press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He is for you. One last thing. Verses 36 through 39. There is no separation. Listen to what Paul says. Who can separate us? I meant verse 35. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to the slaughter. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Listen to this. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. The idea of that term, more than conquerors, is that we are super conquerors. Super conquerors through him that loved us. For Paul said, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. <laughs> there is no separation. There is no condemnation. There is no alienation. There is no separation. That's the benefit that God has given to you and me in our salvation. As a general rule, human love is very conditional. All of us have felt the sting of that kind of love. Because of that experience, we tend to think God's love for us is the same, is love on the same terms. That he loves us as long as we live up to expectations. There are so many things that can threaten the veracity of human love, and, and so when we think we have it, we guard it. We, we guard that human love, lest they find out something that will dash it. Fear often loiters at the door of our lives. And we say to ourselves, what if they find out about my past? What, what if they find out how I've blown it? in my life or the difficulties that I have faced or am facing or 
What if they find out about just the way I've lived my life? And so we live our lives in torment that the one who has pledged their love to us will find reason to withdraw it. And many times they do. Paul wants us to understand that God's love is of a different nature. It is unchangeable. It is unshaken. Here is one who does know. <laughs> he does know. And yet he says to us, what is there that you can do that is going to separate my love from you? Tell me. Put me on the spot. Let me sit here and you tell me what it is that you can do that's going to separate my love from you. Life, death, things present, things to come, angels, the heights of heaven, the depths of hell, what, where are you going to go? There is no other creature, there is nothing God says to you and me that is ever going to come between the love I have for you and you and me. Nothing. Banish the thought. It's not going to happen. Wow. There's nothing in this world or the next, nothing seen or unseen, nothing to be found in the heights of heaven or the depths of hell that can come between us and the love of God. That tells me that I can rest securely in his love for me. He he cannot rest so securely in my love for him. But I can rest securely in his love for me. For no one harms that which it loves perfectly. And John, 1 John tells us that perfect love casteth out fear and that if we fear as a believer we cannot come to spiritual maturity. God led Paul to tell us these things to prepare us for his call to us in Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. What mercies of God, Paul? Romans chapters 1 through 11. By the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, a living dead thing that you you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. <laughs> reasonable. I, I dare you to read Romans 1 through 11 and, and contradict what Paul said about what God has asked us to do. Is he being reasonable? Yes. To, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice and as one I heard one preacher say one time, you know, the problem with living sacrifices is that they keep crawling off the altar. And boy, is that ever true. That's where we're going in Romans. We're going to Romans 12.1. God, uh, God, through Paul, is preparing us for that. And as we make that journey, he has told us these things to give us the assurance and confidence so that we can make that choice of personal surrender of ourselves that will enable God to use us effectively for his purposes here. But until then, remember this. The Lord doesn't condemn us. He makes us fit to serve. He doesn't alienate us. He works in us and he works for us to accomplish his purposes. And I don't have a slide, but let me tell you, his love never fails us. So we can rest securely in his plan and direction. These are truths that we must know and believe and act upon in our lives as believers, whether other people do or do not. This is a personal decision, and we invite you to embrace these truths today. And in doing so, begin the pursuit of God's higher calling in saving your soul.